Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day to day, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or Sam, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the wild survival story of Danielle Keener and Daniel Zepp. But before we get started, if you've not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before I get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Dossier that make it possible to put out videos as consistently as I do. And if you are not familiar with Dossier, which if you've been here a while, you probably should be familiar with Dossier, but don't you worry. You are about to get reacquainted or acquainted for the first time with Dossier. Dossier is a fragrance company, and for the longest time, you guys have heard me singing the praises of Dossier and talking about how they create perfumes that rival luxury brands, but at a fraction of the price. Where most perfumes can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars, Dossier's perfumes range from anywhere from $29 to $49, and they offer bulk deals with up to 25% off and also free shipping when you buy three or more bottles. And that's like tons of ways for you to save your dollar dollar bills. Y'all, and did you know, did you know that Dossier is now branching off into a new area of the scent market? Did you know that? Because let me tell you, they have candles. I know I've talked about their candles before, but I am just so stoked that they are branching out because they do it so well. And I love candles. I am a candle girly. All of their candles are inspired by some of their most popular scents. And I have this big old boy to share with you today. Now this is their Aromatic Star Anise candle. And it's inspired by their perfume that goes by the name of Aromatic Star Anise. And these are inspired by Dior Scent Sauvage, Sauvage perfume, which I've never tried before. But this, listen, this smells so fresh. Okay. Like you would want this. I mean, you'd want this everywhere and anywhere, but I can picture this in my house, either being in the bathroom or if I had a laundry room, the laundry room, but like in like such a good way. Like I'm just picturing this being lit and me getting a fresh load of laundry out of my, my dryer, which I do not have and sitting there folding these warm, fluffy, soft towels. Oh my God. And I actually don't have this perfume, but I should get it because I feel like this is the type of scent that I just want to take with me everywhere. You know what I mean? Now, if a great scent in a candle is not a selling point for you, which I feel arguably most people when they're going in for a candle, that is their number one priority. Something that's very important to me and that I always mention because I think it's like top notch and very important and it's very high on my list of priorities is the Dossier is a cruelty-free fragrance company. And most candle companies are not, and most perfume companies are not for that matter. So the fact that Dossier is doing that is just like chef's kiss. It's a cherry on top of this really great smelling sundae. Now, I've got great news for you. Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off of their entire order with the code BRATTERSCENE at checkout today. You just click the link in my description box and use the code BRATTERSCENE at checkout to get 10% off your order, which is just like such a good deal, especially because they're already so affordable. And then you can get this, you can get discounts with like bulk purchasing and free shipping, all of that jazz. So I can't imagine you finding a better deal out there. So if all that sounds as good as good to you as it does to me, make sure to click the link in my description box and use the code Bratterstein at checkout to get 10% off of your new favorite candle or perfume or multiples of both today. Now, I just want to say a big thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. All right. Now that I'm done spreading the good word of Dossier, we can go ahead and get into this video now. This is a case I stumbled upon when looking up survivor stories in general. And I wanted to cover survival story this week because like we cover a lot of doom and gloom on this channel. And don't get me wrong. This case has a lot of doom and gloom, but it also has, it's a very good representation of just like the resilience of human beings. And the fact that even though it seems like we're incredibly fragile and we definitely are, we are also able to survive some things that just seem totally unsurvivable, to be honest. Human beings can survive truly impossible odds because what these two kids went through, Daniel and Danielle, it's going to get confusing. They go by Dan and Danny throughout the rest of this video, but what they went through, it, they had all odds against them. When you hear about the hell that these two kids went through at the hands of another human being, you'll be so surprised that it's even possible that both of them lived to tell the tale of their deadly chance encounter. 
So today I'm going to tell you that entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it like kicking around in your brain while we go through all the details. But the question of the day is this. How do you think it is possible that Danielle and Daniel survived what happened to them? Because when I tell you, I was up all last night racking my brain trying to figure out how it's possible. Like it just seems, it just seems like it, it, it truly seems impossible. So I want you to let me know all your thoughts below because I am dumbfounded. Now, with all that said, come gather around and let me tell you the wild survival story of Danielle Keener and Daniel Zapp. Now, I want to start this video off with a quote. This is a quote from Danielle herself, and this kind of gives you her mindset around what happened to her and Daniel. She said, and I quote, we are not victims. We are survivors. Our story begins on January 7th of the year 2000 at about 4.45 p.m. just outside of York, Pennsylvania. And this is where three men were out duck hunting and fishing near the Susquehanna River. It was here that a man named Dean who went by Pete was just hanging out with his friends, you know, chilling, not killing, when he looked out into the river into the distance and he saw two forms. He wasn't really sure what he was looking at, so he just kind of watched them as they floated closer to him. And as he looked, he started to realize that what he was seeing was the, were the forms of two people. And as he got closer still, he heard a voice calling out to him. So he walked out into the water, he got close, and he realized that what he was seeing was a teenage boy who was grabbing onto a teenage girl. So he grabbed the boy's hand and he pulled both of them out onto the shore. Neither of the kids could talk. They were both shaking violently and it was very clear that they had been through hell. Pete could tell just by looking at them that both of these kids had been shot in the head and that if he didn't get them help soon, they weren't gonna make it. He actually thought that even if he did get them help soon, that they probably weren't going to survive. And this was 18 year old Danielle Keener and her friend, 18 year old Daniel Zapp. So who were Danielle and Daniel? Danielle, who went by Danny, was a kind-hearted and genuine girl who was said to have a great personality. And she was an 18-year-old freshman at Susquehanna University, and she was on a second date with Danielle Zapp, who was a college freshman also, but from another university, the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Now, Daniel, who went by Dan, was the eldest of three children and was from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And he was said to be a real down to earth guy, a solid and mature person who played soccer, ran cross country and performed in the school theater. Dan and Danny met through mutual friends a couple of months into their freshman college experience. And the two really hit it off. They like went to dinner and they found that they had a ton in common and like a lot to talk about. So they actually spent the better part of four months getting to know each other online because they were kind of, you know, long distance. And they found that they were really into each other. They were super compatible. They had a lot of chemistry. Their date when they went out to dinner went super well. So they were going to be getting together again and going on their second date. And Danielle was super, super stoked about this. The day of their abduction and attempted murder, Dan was actually on winter break from school. So he decided that he was going to take that opportunity to make the drive from his school to her school. I think it was like a two hour drive so that they could hang out and see each other and spend some time together since this is a girl that he was developing some pretty strong feelings for, right? So he gets there, they hang out and they decide that they're going to go on like a little Saturday, Saturday, uh, that word got lost in my mouth, Saturday afternoon date. Sounds so pure, except obviously it's not. Otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it today. So Danny and Dan didn't really have a plan for their date. Like they went out on their date, but they didn't really have a plan of what they were going to do. So they actually headed to a nearby boat launch um, where they knew that they could go and walk near the water. And this was by Three Mile Island in Goldsboro, which was Danny's hometown. So they're walking around, they're picking up stones that they can throw them in the river and try to skip them across the river. They're talking about their day. They're catching up. They're talking about meeting some friends of Danny's and a mall leader, like a totally normal day until it wasn't. So they're there, they're hanging out. And about 15 minutes after they get there, a maroon truck pulls up and inside the truck, there's a man and there is a Rottweiler named Sam. So the guy gets out and he's like, Hey, do you mind? Like if I let my dog get out, you know, cause he's a big dog and kids, you know, being considerate or so you would think. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. So the man and his dog get out and Sam, the dog goes and starts splashing around the water, being an adorable dog as adorable dogs are. And while that's happening, the man and Dan and Danny start making small talk and speaking to one another. And the guy starts asking him questions like how old they were and where they lived and what school they went to, all that jazz. And they were being nice and they were, you know, answering his questions, but they could tell that he was like clearly intoxicated because he asked them the same questions over and over. And he also had like some red, droopy, drunk looking eyeballs. Once Sam the dog was finished playing, the man took his dog and he put him in his truck and he was about to drive off. But before he drove off, he asked them like, hey, do you guys need a ride anywhere? To which they politely 
declined. And so he drove off and it seemed totally normal. He seemed like a totally normal guy. Seemed like a totally normal interaction. Although he was like a little bit drunk, he wasn't like unfriendly. He drove off and they continued to walk next to the water. The two didn't notice at first that as they were walking by the water, the man had actually turned his truck around and had started following them. He was driving super, super slowly behind them and then would pass them. He actually passed them a couple of times. And in one instance, he was starting to pass them and going super slow. And then he saw like a police car nearby. So he sped off and it noticing that this guy was kind of hanging around and driving super slow and making them uncomfortable. They felt like the vibes were off and they decided that it was time for them to leave. Unfortunately, though, before they got a chance to actually leave, the man came back. He drove his truck up next to the right of them. And from there, things happened super fast. He ended up pulling his truck um, like in front of them and blocking their path. And he got out with a gun. He pointed a nine millimeter at them and was like, get in the fucking truck. And they knew immediately that he was serious. I mean, he does have a gun. And they also knew that there was nothing they could do because to one side of them was the water. And to the other side of them, there was a steep hill. So they couldn't even run. It didn't feel real to them. It felt like a nightmare. And Dan did everything he could. He pled with the man. He offered him money. He offered him his wallet, which the man did take. He offered him his car, his car keys. He offered him his laptop that was in his car. And the man was not interested. He was not interested in their possessions. He wanted to take them. So he ordered them to get in the truck. And at first he ordered both of them to get in the back of the truck because it was like a truck, but it had like a camper, like a shell. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. But then he changed his mind and he actually told Dan to get in the back by himself with, with Sam, the dog, obviously, cause Sam was going to, you know, be a very serious guard dog and watch him, even though he was like a super nice dog, they said, but he ordered Dan to get in the back and they had Danny get in the front with him. Once in the truck, the guy takes off. Now keep in mind, this is something that kind of blew my mind. When I was picturing this in my head, as I was reading through the whole case the first time, I was picturing this happening at night. You know what I mean? Cause this feels like very much a nighttime thing to do, but I was reading an old York daily record article, like a newspaper clipping newspapers.com, the best resource ever. And it's had like a timeline of this case in there. And this abduction happened at like 3.30 PM. Isn't that crazy? I don't know what it is about that little fact, like picturing this happening in broad daylight, but it like destroyed my brain. Anyways, while they were in the truck and they were driving, it felt like they were driving for ever and all the while the kidnapper was scaring the shit out of Danny. So she's sitting there in the passenger seat, her knees like up to her chest because she's got her feet on a case of beer because again, this guy's hammered. He has a case of beer in his car. He's just getting drunk and he's driving with one hand. He's pointing a gun at her with the other and he is just ranting and raving, talking about the fact that the fact, talking about the fact saying to her that the reason that the two of them have been abducted is because there were some men who were paying him like a group of people who were paying him because of something that her father did, which spoiler alert, that was determined to be a lie. And then he was saying that like there was a bad drug debt and they were being taken as like collateral damage. And again, the lie detector determined that was a lie. He just kept rambling on and on. And then, oh my God, this part like destroys me. So they're driving right? And during this ordeal, they actually drive by Danny's house. Okay. And in her front yard is her 16 year old brother, Michael and her stepdad. So she sees them and they see her, her brother looks right at her and she decides that she wants to try to like get his attention without being obvious. So she waves at him strangely with just one finger, something that like she would never do, hoping that he'd see it and think it was weird. And apparently he did see it and thought it was a little bit strange. He's like, what is she doing? but he didn't think anything really of it and ended up thinking that she was just waving at him. So he just waved back. Now this is horrible, but this guy is an absolute monster. So during the 90 minutes that these two were with this man, cause that's how long they were with him from the moment they were abducted to the time he tried to kill them as he was driving, he stopped the truck twice on the 12 mile stretch. Cause it was a 12 mile stretch of road that he drove from point A to point B. Both times he stopped that truck. He ordered Danny to perform oral sex on him. And each time he told her that if she did it, she, he would let them go. And he also told her that if she didn't do it, he was going to shoot her. So this is happening and Dan is in the back and he knows something's going on. Right. And he even tries to look a couple of times to see what's going on. And each time he would, the, the kidnapper would tell Danny to tell Dan to get down. So he's back there knowing full well what's happening to her up there and he can't do anything about it. And what's really messed up is he had his cell phone on him and he said he was trying to call 911, but he couldn't get service, which I mean, it is the two thousands and cell phones are so different. I know now I'm pretty sure you can always get through to 911. I think I have not needed to thankfully, but he couldn't do anything. And I guess while he was back there, he was also looking around and he saw an aluminum bat and was like, Oh, I could like stuff it in my jacket and try to attack this guy. But he thought it was too risky of a move since he had a gun. So he couldn't do anything. And it just feels like such 
a hopeless situation. So they keep driving and finally the man turns left onto this uh, dirt road. This was Gut Road near East Manchester Township and he stopped the truck next to the Susquehanna River and again ordered Danny to give him oral sex. And she just kept crying and begging him to let them go and to let them like be safe. And she said like she would do whatever he wanted. Once there, he orders the kids out of the truck and they're standing by the water and he's like being really erratic. They're standing there and he's pacing back and forth with a gun in his hand, talking about how he didn't know what he was going to do because he, you know, they had seen his face and all the while he's shooting off rounds like with the gun into the water behind them. The two of them are just huddled into each other, terrified. And Danny's sitting there realizing with each shot that this guy could kill them. He could take their lives right then if he wanted to. And she's just terrified, wondering what she could do to stop this man from killing her and Dan. After terrorizing these two for a while by the water, he orders them back into the truck. Once in the truck, it's Dan in the back again, him in the driver's seat and Danny in the passenger seat. He turns to her and he says to her, so you said you would do anything. And it's at that moment that Danny knew that she was going to be raped and there wasn't anything she could do about it. So she just sat there and stared straight ahead and nodded her head because she knew that this was going to happen. And it's just, it sounds so, it's just, I can't imagine being in that situation. She just says that she didn't want to die and she didn't want Dan to die because of her. So then he did. He raped Danny in the front of that truck while Dan had to stay in the back knowing full well what was going on, but do it, not being able to do anything about it. And one report I read, but it was only one report, so I don't know if this is you know accurate, said that this man was not able to perform. So he stopped at some point and ordered her to just perform oral on him again. Once he was finished assaulting Danny, he ordered both of them out of the truck again and told them to walk towards the water. The two grabbed hold of one of each other and complied. While they walked, Danny was just praying. She hoped that he had gone, gotten like what he wanted from her and he'd let the two of them go. But then she heard a gunshot. And at first she thought the guy was just shooting rounds off in the water again, like he had before. But then Dan fell to the ground. He fell on the ground right in front of her and blood started to come out of his mouth. And she said at that moment, she knew she was next. She knew that if Dan had been shot, she was going to be shot. So there wasn't even use of trying to run. So instead she just dropped to her knees next to Dan to see if he was okay. And the two told each other that they loved each other and they said their goodbyes. And it was at that moment that everything went black for Danny. She said that she never felt any pain. She just felt like a lot of pressure in her head, kind of like a big explosion. And she said right after that, she fell straight into the water. And once she was in the water, he shot her again in her like upper thigh near her groin. The next thing she remembered, she was waking up in the river and her body was totally numb. She said all she could remember was like kind of spitting things out of her mouth. And it was at that point that she realized that she had either been shot in the head or in the mouth. So she's laying there in this river, unable to move, totally numb. And she starts praying harder than she ever prayed in her entire life. But this time she's just praying for God to take her. Shortly after that, she saw Dan in the river and to her amazement, he was somehow alive. So the two laid there and kind of floated to each other and held on to each other. But once they did that, they looked up to the shore and they realized that the man was still there. So Dan said to Danny, like, obviously really quietly, like, don't move play dead. If we play dead, maybe this man will leave and we can just float along the river and see what happens. So that's what they did. They just laid there and pretended that they were dead. They waited and waited for what I can only imagine felt like forever. But finally, the man did get into his truck and he drove away. From there, Dan and Danny just laid in the water, water that was so cold that it actually slowed down their bleeding. And they floated along until finally they were safe. A man named Dean, who went by Pete, you remember Pete, him and his friend Gary and Don had been duck hunting and fishing in the area about 100 yards down from where the shot happened. And this was just after 4.45 p.m. He looked in the water and in the distance he saw the two forms floating his way and he waited, not sure what he was seeing. But then once they got close enough, he could tell there were two people and he heard the voice calling out to him. So he walked into the water and grabbed Dan's hand, pulling the two to the shore. These men were later referred to as these kids' angels because they saved their lives. You know, he went out into the water. They pulled them to shore. They called 911. They kept them warm until paramedics could arrive to save them. They really were, for, you know, all intents and purposes, these kids' angels. It's just so wild, dude, because this, this water in this river could have easily killed them. All the reports I read about this river said that it's like a wild one. And they were in there, shot in the head 
unable to move, freezing, not able to swim, just floating along. And somehow, instead of killing them, it saved them, slowed down their bleeding, and gave them an avenue to escape their kill their attempted murder. It's just wild, man. Anyways, once pulled to the shore, as I said, Dan and Danny, bad shape, shaking violently. They can't talk. Dan's got blood coming out of his mouth and he's like choking on it. And Pete knows that like, they're probably not going to make it, but he does what he can regardless. The police are summoned and both of them are rushed to the hospital. That night, January 8th, police officers had to make phone calls to Dan and Danny's parents to let them know that their kids had been shot. Okay. So Danny's dad, his name was Brent. He lived in Harrisburg, which is about 35 minutes away from where his daughter was like in the hospital. And he gets this call letting him know that his daughter was shot in the face. He grabbed his phone and he actually grabbed a photo of Danny that he took with him. And he held the entire drive from his home to the hospital. And all the while he was just talking to this picture. He had no idea if his daughter was going to make it, if he'd ever see her again. So he was just praying that she would be okay. He said when he first saw her in that condition that she was in, cause she was really, you know, she, she looked pretty messed up. He just had a serious feeling of helplessness because he was her father. It was his job to save her and protect her. And he couldn't do anything about it. And then on top of that, knowing what she went through, he just kept asking why, like, why would this happen to her? She was so innocent, but there were no answers. Police Chief Albright promised Danny's parents that he would do everything in his power to catch the guy who did this to their daughter. And he was a father of two daughters that were close to Danny's age. So this hit him particularly hard. And if it wasn't just that, he had a lot of pressure from the community. They were angry. They were outraged. They were scared. And he knew he needed to catch whoever did this as quickly as possible. So many people were there for these kids. Danny's mom headed over, obviously her parents were there. Even her friend Elizabeth went over. And I guess Elizabeth was her like close friend and also her roommate in college. The two had met in freshman orientation. They bonded over the fact that they were both like super stoked about college. Like this was their Le passion and they got to be super duper close. They really hit it off. And so they really cared about each other. So when she heard what happened to her friend, she was terrified. She was terrified that Danny wasn't going to make it, but she was also terrified of how Danny would be if she did survive, because this is the type of thing that you never totally come back from. You're never the person you were prior to something like this happening to you. You are reborn, so to speak, as a new version. And she didn't know what that was going to look like. When she first got to the hospital, she heard the details of what happened to her friend from Danny's mother. And she was just like, blown away. She was shocked. Like she was like, first off, who would do this? And her first thought was that Dan and Danny were not going to survive this because she had never heard of a person getting shot in the head and living to tell the tale. And like, that is what always blew my mind. Cause like, I know that you can, I've seen regarding Henry, but which is a movie, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's an older movie, but it still like blows my mind whenever I hear of somebody surviving something like that, because it seems like an unsurvivable thing. The two of them had such serious injuries, dude. Danny had been shot through her jaw. It was totally shattered. And the daughter, the daughter, the doctor who looked at it said that it was in so many pieces that it looked like Rice Krispies and her face had swollen to the size of a bowling ball. The shot had almost severed her tongue, dude. And Dan had been shot through the backside of his neck below his ear. And it went right through his windpipe and exited on the other side through his jaw. They were actually both shot through the jaw and they both needed reconstructive surgery and they both actually had several surgeries. And as far as Dan goes, the shot also chipped one of his vertebrae and then the other one grazed his right ear. It was just so brutal, dude. One of the detectives working the case, this was Detective Doug. He said that the brutality of this crime was beyond comprehension. Like who could do this? How can you shoot two kids in the head? And before that, raping Danny? Like what kind of monster could do something like this? They were just really lucky to be alive. Even the DA, one of the DAs, I think there was, is there more than one DA? Anyway, DA Paskey said that talking about what happened to these kids would send shivers down his spine, like what they survived through. And then he added, quote, I don't think you'll ever find two individuals with the courage and determination of these two young people. So police go to the hospital to interview the kids, right? Because that's what you do. And when they get there, they find that Danny is actually in an induced coma. So she's not able to speak to them. But Dan, despite everything he went through, was actually awake. So Dan had all the injuries that I already described to you. But on top of that, doctors were really afraid that he was going to get a blood clot and that the blood clot would cut off oxygen to his brain. And he was in a ton of pain. And he was in so much pain that like every move he like would make, would make the pain worse. And on top of that, he was on a ventilator, so he couldn't actually speak, but he was determined to help police 
catch whoever did this to them. So they came up with like a system so he could speak to them. They gave him a patent paper so he could write answers. And they also, he would like make a fist and he would move it up and down for yes and shake it like side to side for no. So once they had all of that in place so that they knew they could talk to one another, they started to question Dan. Dan was able to tell police that the man who attacked them was white. He was 35 to 40 years old. He was about 5'10". He was wearing a brown hat, blue jeans, and black shoes. Dan was able to tell police that the man was clearly drunk and that he even had a case of Natty Ice in his truck. He told police that the gun that he used to attack them was a black semi-automatic and was able to tell police that the man had a Rottweiler who was named Sam. Like, this is a lot of details on one person. He described the vehicle as a beat up red pickup truck with a white or gray cap and described items in the back of the truck like a toolbox and an aluminum baseball bat. So they had a lead to try to find this guy, but it was a very daunting task because there was a lot of ground to cover. They were going to have to search from where the crime took place to where they were pulled out of the river, right? Like all of that had to be searched. But first they had to find the crime scene. So officers went to the water's edge and they walked shoulder to shoulder all across the ground, looking down for any sign of something that took place. And finally they found a pool of blood. And then when they went closer to the water, they found the casings from a nine millimeter. So they knew this was where it happened. From there, detectives go and they speak to local police so that they could see if maybe they had an idea of who they were looking for. They told them all about them. They told them about the truck. They told them about the dog. And quickly the officer, the local police officer tells the detectives like, I have idea of somebody who you might want to look into. It was a 40 year old man who was local to the area who had had lots of run-ins with police due to things like domestic violence, alcohol, things like that. And this man owned a Rottweiler. This guy was bad news and he was known to be somebody who was violent, but anytime he did anything violent to somebody, they never pressed charges against him because he was always doing these things to his family members or people he was dating. But he was known to police like officer Tina, the local lady told detectives that as soon as she heard that a vehicle matching the description of this guy's vehicle was in the area, she knew it was him because she knew he was capable of great violence. In hearing all of this, the detectives want to see if maybe this is the guy who did this to the kids, because when they're hearing all this, they're like, that sounds like a pretty good lead. So from there they go and they create like a photo lineup, you know, they take a bunch of pictures, including this guy's picture. They put them all together and they take them to Dan so that he can, you know, so they can see if anyone in the stack, was somebody who might have done this to him. You know, you know how this lineup works. So they go, they start flipping down the photos for Dan to see. And as soon as this particular man's photo was laid down for Dan, he reacted very strongly. Like he couldn't speak, but his eyes and his body language, pure horror, horror, horror. One of Dan's eyes was swollen shut, but the other was open. And as soon as he saw this photo, his pupil dilated and he started hitting the photo over and over. So just as a formality, because you know, they have to, the officer looked at him and was like, Dan, is this the guy who did it to you? And Dan signaled, yes. And he was like, are you sure? He got another yes. So the cop looked at Dan and was like, I'm going to go get him for you. Dan said of this moment, like, even though seeing him was very traumatizing and very scary for him. He was also so glad to see his photo because that meant that they knew who it was and that he was going to be caught and that he couldn't do this again. And that even if he would not admit that he was the person who did this, Dan knew, Danny would know, and this man would pay for what he did to them. And this man, this monster we're talking about is William Edward Babner. Now, I don't know a ton about William, but I will tell you what I do know. I know he was a high school dropout who lived in York Haven for a time and that he wasn't a good guy. In addition to what detectives Tina, officer Tina had already said about him, his former landlord did speak out after he was arrested. And this was a man named Claire Donald Sawmiller. And Claire said that he and William had been good friends. They drive to work together at an excavating company. And he'd even sold William the truck that he used in the attack and two guns and let him rent a trailer that he owned. Like they were pretty close. Claire said that his friendship with William ended when like a couple of things happened. First off, he like screwed him on rent, which, you know, that's a pretty messed up thing to do when somebody lets you like live on their property. He also like destroyed the trailer. He like pissed all over the rugs and like ripped off like the wood paneling to use as kindling. He also said that William threatened him several times that he was always threatening to shoot him. And he said that William was always threatening to shoot people just in general. He was one of those people that was like, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot you. I've never met a person that's just doing that. But apparently William was always doing that. 
Claire also said that like William was an all right guy unless he was drinking, but said that he drank like every single day and then he would get radical and violent and want to fight people. And he said that he got to the point that he wouldn't go to the trailer that he owned any more than he had to because he was scared for his life. He ended up actually having to evict William because William would not leave. And it was successful. He did get him out and he did get a money judgment against him. But I'm going to guess that like William never paid that judgment because he sounds like a real asshole. But that aside, he was known to be violent, even though he had never been charged and like convicted of a violent crime, not charged, convicted of a violent crime because the people they committed the crimes against didn't want to press charges against him. Reports had been made. So there is a record of it. William allegedly used a chainsaw to cut up a bunch of his old girlfriend's items who was leaving him. He also allegedly attacked her van with an ax and he had restraining orders against him. He had guns, he had bows and arrows, he had knives, he had a chainsaw. He had, he was a violent guy with a lot of weapons. He had also been in some trouble when for whatever reason, he rammed his truck over and over into his own brother's car while he and his girlfriend, a woman named Barbara were in the car. And luckily, he wasn't hurt. Or, no, excuse me. Not luckily. He wasn't hurt. Luckily, they weren't hurt. But apparently, as their car spun out, he yelled and laughed while they lost control. He was also said to have set his neighbor's shed on fire after the two got into a fight. So he had done a lot of things, but every time he would do something dangerous or unhinged, he would just have to pay a fine. And that was it. So now a suspect has been identified and a manhunt is underway and they look everywhere for him, anywhere they think he could be, places he frequented, associates, homes. They search and they search and they search, but they are unable to find him. So they call it a night, they go home and almost immediately somebody actually spots his truck. So they have to go back out to go and arrest him. And they actually set up a SWAT team to go and make this arrest because they believe it's likely that this could be like a violent arrest. At about midnight, police head over to where his truck was parked. And it was actually parked at a home in York City. And this is where his girlfriend lived. And he was living with his girlfriend at the time, along with her two children. So SWAT set up about a house away. And then they just wait and they wait and they wait for hours. And their initial plan was to actually try to arrest William when he left for work that morning, but he never like left the house. Apparently his boss ended up calling him when he just didn't show up. And he was like, Oh yeah, I'm sick with the flu. I'll be back in on Monday. So now police know that they have to kind of change gears. After some time of waiting, William's girlfriend actually left the home. And as soon as she left the home, she was like, and he was, she was like out of sight of the home. Police like swarmed her and they questioned her. And from talking to her, they were able to get an idea of who was in the house and what the schedule was for that day. She told police that at about 8 PM, no, 8 a.m. Her five-year-old son was going to be leaving for school and like to get on the school bus and that William was going to be walking him to the bus to make sure he got on and got to school. Okay. So police decided that it would be better to arrest him when there wasn't a five-year-old in the house. So their plan was to let William take him, get him on the school bus. And as soon as the kid was out of harm's way, they were going to, you know, come down and arrest William. And that is what they did kinda, which we will get there. Cause that's a whole nother thing that I was like, what? But we'll get there. Once the boy was on the bus, the snipers told the men on the ground, like it is go time. So they go and they run to the house. And at about 8 30 AM, they arrest him in his bathroom. He has no chance to do anything. Cause he had no idea they were coming and they were so fast. So he's taken into custody. And this is, I believe less than two days after Dan and Danny had been attempted to be killed. That's not the right way to say that, but you know what I'm trying to say. So there was some backlash over this arrest because when I tell you these police officers do be wild. And apparently what happened is this bus that was going to pick up this five-year-old boy that was filled with seven special needs children, might I add, was driven by a police officer. Apparently this bus driver, this woman had just been driving along when her bus was commandeered a la speed. If you've seen that movie and the person was like, I'm going to be taking over. This person was a police officer was like, I'm going to be taken over. You lay on the ground so that nobody can see you. I'm going to drive this bus and go pick up this kid because they figured that if, you know, the bus like didn't show up on time or if the bus showed up empty, like with no kids in it, William might figure that something was up and things could get worse. But like they also switched the usual driver, which was a woman to this random dude and then parked in a weird spot. So they were already doing weird shit. Um, but sure, they said that they, you know, parked the bus out of the line of fire. So, you know, nobody needed to worry about their kids, to which I say, um, fuck off. But it's just so crazy to me. I guess after they picked up the boy, they drove down a little bit and then the officer was like, okay, 
I'm going to go now. You go ahead and just finish your route. And the cop jumped off and she got back in the driver's seat and she like drove. Can you imagine being her? I guess she was super shooken up by the whole situation because she didn't know this was going to happen. This wasn't planned. Police said that they did this because they were worried that William was going to freak out and take the boy hostage. So in order to stop that, they kind of put all of these kids in danger because what if something had gone wrong? They would have been right next to a violent man with a gun. And when I tell you that parents were pissed, bro, which I would have been too, I would have been so fucking pissed. I'm going to say it now. I would have lost my mind and the school was mad too because again this wasn't planned these officers just randomly willy-nilly commandeered this bus now police did come out later and said that like they were proud of their work they said that generally operations like this that were working with so many jurisdictions don't typically go off without a hitch but this did and they were able to arrest a very dangerous man super quickly and that was good police work they then said that like ideally taking the kids off of the bus would have been the safest route to go, but that that wasn't an option. The time wasn't there. So basically people should just be happy that everything went well. That was their response. And I read that and I was like, you guys are wild. <laughs> like my, no, 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 no. I will say as a parent now, I would be super pissed just because like, okay, I know you have to catch the super violent man. Like I want this man caught, but could they not just let him come? Normal bus situation, normal bus driver, they're watching. Let him come, put the kid on the bus, let him walk back into the house and arrest him there. Could they not just do that? Considering that's what they ended up doing anyway and didn't need to involve any kids at all. Let me know your thoughts on this. Would you be super pissed if this was your kid? Cause this blew my mind. But anyways, He's arrested, and once officers were inside his home, they found so much evidence against him. They found all the things he had been wearing that night, and they found the gun, and they even found Sam the pup, and everything was just like Dan said it would be down to what was in the bed of the truck and the studded collar that Sam was wearing. And if that hadn't been enough, both Dan and Danny's blood were on his clothes, so his goose effectively cooked. After William was arrested, police knew that they were going to have some issues because their case would clearly be stronger and strongest if Dan and Danny could testify. But at this point, they were still in such bad shape that people weren't sure what the outcome was going to be with them. They weren't sure if they were going to make it. Speaking of Dan and Danny, let's go back to them. So as I said, Danny was in a coma and she was in this medically induced coma for five days. And while she was in this coma, she underwent surgery. Her tongue had been shot and nearly severed, so it was repaired, and a plate was put into her jaw, and her jaw was wired shut. So once Danny woke up in the hospital, she had a lot going on. She had a tube sticking out of her stomach and a tracheotomy, and was clearly suffering and in a lot of pain, but the meds made her hallucinate. And considering what had just happened to her, the hallucinations she was having, the visions, the, the, the imagery, if you will, was not kind. It wasn't something you wanted to be seeing. She saw bloody people, the floating bodies of kids and people hanging. And every time she saw something new, she would, she would write down everything that she saw. Her family was there. And when she would have these freakouts, they would like comfort her, but they really couldn't help her much because one, they didn't know what she was going through. And two, every time she looked at her, her own mother, she would see blood like running down her mom's face. She couldn't sleep because her dreams were so horrifying. So she would force herself to stay awake, but she was lucky because she didn't have to go through all of this by herself. She had her mother, Cindy there, her stepdad, George, and her father, Brent, were all there taking shifts to sit there. So she wouldn't have to be alone with everything she was going through. On top of going through it mentally, she was also going through it physically. The first time she looked at herself in the mirror, she like saw herself from the chest up. She started to cry. She hate she hated what she saw. She hated the feeling of the wire in her jaw and the dirt between her teeth. And on top of that, she woke up thinking that Dan was dead. She was convinced that he had not made it. Despite her seeing him pulled from the river too, she was convinced that he did not make it. Even when she, her family told her, she would ask him like, where's Dan? And they were like, he's fine. He's just down the hall. She did not believe them. She was so convinced that he was gone that her family had to go to him. They're like, hey, could you like write her a note. So he did. He wrote her a note that just said like, Danny, I love you. I'm okay. And that's when she finally like believed that he had made it. Can you even imagine how hard all of that would be mentally? Cause I truly cannot. Six months after the attempted murder, the trial began. And even though there was so much evidence against William, when the charges were read out, he shook his head. No, like he was appalled that these things were being said about him and he pled not guilty, but he was held. He was given bond, but he was given a million dollar bond, $500,000 for each of his victims. 
I don't know what he thought, you know, I don't sometimes when there's this much evidence, I'm always wondering, like, what are these people thinking? Because they had so much against him. They had um, one of the victims actually pointing him out, you know what I mean? Like recognizing him in a photo lineup. They had their blood, Dan and Danny's blood on his clothing. They had his tire tracks, right? The tire tracks that were at the scene, they matched him to the tires on his truck. And even some of Sam's dog hair was matched to dog hair that was on Dan's coat. But anyways, he pled guilty, so they would have to go to trial. This would be totally re-traumatizing for Dan and Danny. They were so scared to have to do this, to have to go and be confronted by him, to be just feet away from him. They were filled with terror and anxiety. And the prosecutor thinks that William only did this, only pled not guilty and made them go through a trial so that he could make them relive everything he put them through publicly again, because William didn't even testify at his own trial. When Dan and Danny testified, the whole courtroom was totally silent. Danny broke down as she saw evidence, her clothes caked in mud that were literally cut from her body and the gun. It was incredibly difficult for her. She knew that during her testimony, all the details that she was going to be giving, especially when it came to the rape, were going to be given to a courtroom full of people, which included her family. And this meant that these people were going to know exactly what she had gone through. They were going to know details that she was not ready to share with people yet, but she had to. And despite the fact that she was going through hell, she did really well. She was on the stand for, I believe, 30 minutes total, and she made it through 25 minutes before she finally broke down and started to cry. She told the court through tears, like, I am 19 years old. I am not supposed to go through something like this. Dan testified over the phone, actually from college. He, I don't believe he was ever, I think he might've been there for the sentencing, but I don't think he was there for the actual trial, but he testified over the phone and he said that he finds it impossible to talk to strangers and he has a harder and harder time even caring about other people. It's like, this man destroyed his empathy. And then he went on to tell the court his, you know, recollection of what happened to them because he had sort of a different point of view, a different vantage point than Danny did. He told the court his whole memory of the event from the moment they were abducted to the moment they were shot. He said he remembered begging William to let them go and offering him anything and everything that they had and that the man just told him to shut up. He said he remembered laying there listening to the girl he cared about being raped and not being able to do anything about it. And he said he knew when they were being led from that truck to the river that they were going to be shot and that they were going to die. Like he didn't have any of that hope that they were now going to be let go like Danny did. He was asked like, did you ever try to escape? Like, why didn't you ever try to run? And he said that he never tried to run because he was worried if he did that this man was going to kill Danny. He said that when he was shot, he just felt a tremendous force that knocked him to the ground. And he said that he just laid there looking at the dirt and watching his blood fall from his own mouth. And that he just felt very cold and very tired, very fast. He said when Danny kneeled down beside him, he just told her like, I'm sorry, but I have to go now. And the next thing he remembered, he felt his body being turned over and over and blood patterns showed that this was actually William kicking him into the water after he was shot. He said after feeling that turning over and over thing, he felt the shocking cold of like the swirling cold water that he was dumped into. And it kind of like made him wake up. And that's when he looked over and he saw Danny in the water as well. Danny has repeatedly said that Dan was her hero and her savior in this situation. There was even a point where they were in the water together and their hands separated. And Dan used all his strength to swim back to her, grab her and start pulling her towards shore. Like he did everything for her. He was conscious and aware and thinking and trying and saving. And even the DA said that Dan had helped solve this case because if William had been successful in what he had intended to do, which was kill them, he probably would have gotten away with it because there wasn't a connection between the murderer and his victims. You know what I mean? Like if he had been successful, he would have killed them and there was no connection between them. So it would have been super hard to solve. Dan has said he does not consider himself a hero. It's not a thing that he thinks about himself. And he seemed a little bit like like he found it weird when people would say it, but he did also say that he was glad he was there and he would do it a thousand times over if it meant he was saving Danny. Now, as for William, I guess his attorneys did the best that they could with what they had. Like they really didn't have a lot to work with. They basically just tried to prove that intent wasn't there, that William didn't intend to do what he did and that he didn't even have a memory of doing it. Cause I guess he was pretty like smashed. He had like Xanax, Ritalin, Prozac, and enough alcohol to render a human comatose in his system, which made it so he could not even remember what he had done. 
when Danny heard like that this was going to be the route that they were doing, she was just kind of like too bad. So sad. Just because he doesn't remember doing it doesn't mean that he gets away with doing it. He still needs to pay for what he did. And then she said, quote, what right did he have to put our lives in his hands? So after about a week of trial in August of 2000, the jury was sent to do their thing. And after only about an hour of deliberation, they came back. Dan and Danny were holding each other when they found that William had been found guilty. He was found guilty of two counts of attempted murder, two counts of kidnapping, one count of robbery because he took 40 or $45 from Dan, three counts of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and one count of rape. And then he was also charged with carrying a firearm without a license, but that was like the least of the things he had done wrong. More than a dozen friends and families, like friends and families, friends and family members swarmed Dan and Danny and just hugged them and were their support and held them up. Like they were really overwhelmed with emotion. Like they felt a huge sense of relief, but it was also just like, you know, I can't imagine being in that position, but it feels like a wave, right? Of just like, what is going on? But he had been found guilty. And now all that was left was the sentencing. And speaking of the sentencing, Dan said of this, and I quote, although I feel a lot of anger towards this man, I'm not excited about sending him away to jail for the rest of his life. I'm just glad it's over. Which honestly is like so big of this teenage boy. You know what I mean? Like that is big of you to not want to send this guy who did this to you to jail for the rest of his life because I want this guy to be in jail for the rest of his life. And he didn't do anything to me. <laughs> Before handing down his sentence, the judge, you know, reviewed William's prior criminal history, you know, weighing the mitigating and aggravating factors against each other to see what he should be sentenced with. They noted that he had a conviction for drunk driving, dealing weed, welfare fraud. They also noted that he had a quote, thin employment record and has persistent problems with drugs and alcohol. And that in combination with all of the things that were on his record that I already told you about made the judge come to the determination that this man needed to be locked away for a long, long time. For his crimes, he was facing 20 to 40 years for each of his counts of attempted murder, and then 10 to 20 years for the other crimes. Ultimately, William was given 117 and a half to 235 years in prison. He will literally be 150 years old before he's even eligible for parole. And all of his sentences are to be ran consecutively, not concurrently. The prosecutor was like, listen, this man is the face of evil. And the next time he's going to leave jail is in a box and he deserves every single one of those years he was given. To which I'm like, damn, I've covered two survivor stories recently. And in both cases, these men got so much jail time. And to that, I just want to slow clap because I feel like we've covered cases before where they get such minimal. Sorry about that. Where they get such minimal jail time because their victims were strong enough to survive. And it's like your intent was there, my guy. You should be punished for that. Let me know what you think about that. Should their sentences be this harsh when it comes to attempted murder? Because I feel like we're all on the same page, but I don't know. if Maybe if you have an opposing view what that is, let me know. Anyways, I got off on a thing there. But the judge said to William, quote, Mr. Babner, the acts you committed on Danielle Keener and Daniel Zapp were ruthless, senseless, heartless acts of violence. You have forever destroyed their youth, emotional well-being, trust, and innocence. How do they sleep at night? How will they ever erase your face from their minds? William, who showed no emotion at all during the trial, just kneeled on a chair in his shackles, waiting to be led back to prison. And the DA said that this was the first step in putting a very dangerous monster behind bars for a long time. When William was asked if he had anything he wanted to say, he simply handed his attorney a piece of paper. And when the attorney read it, it said that uh, he had ineffective counsel, his attorney was fired, and he immediately planned to appeal. What a dick, right? Like, I mean, we know he's a dick, but he's just like one of those guys. Like, for example, when he was in jail, he like gave an interview or something. I can't remember who he was talking to, but he said that like he didn't remember doing what he did, but that he was starting to get some memories back of it. And if he had done what they were saying he did, and he was starting to believe that he did, that he should get life in prison because what he did was a terrible thing. But then he's like, I'm going to go ahead and appeal. So he's just an asshole and a liar. Anyways, Dan and Danny did try to stay in contact and communicate with each other. After all was said and done, they would always talk to each other on the anniversary of them being rescued. And they even at one point went to the river's edge where they had been, you know, where everything had happened. Um, and they did this the year that William was convicted, but their relationship was just never the same as it had been before that. 
every time they talked to each other, it was just like bringing up the past over and over and over again. And Dan said that when he would talk to her, he would just feel bad. He would think about all the ways he failed and all the ways that he couldn't save her. And it got to the point that he dreaded those conversations. So they just kind of drifted apart while they took their separate time to heal. Transitioning back to school was really hard for Danielle. She had a lot of trouble feeling safe and trusting people, as I'm sure you can imagine. She was really withdrawn, particularly when it came to men that she didn't know. And she was just like really scared. She had trouble. She couldn't walk alone at night. She had nightmares that kept her up. And it was really upsetting for those who knew her because they could see her suffering and in so much pain and so scared. And they wanted to help her, but there was nothing that they could do to help her. Danielle knew that she had like a lot of inner work that she had to do herself so that she could heal. And she did do this because four months after the conviction at the school, they had this thing called the Take Back the Night on campus, which was a rally against rape where people could go and speak about their experiences and use their voices. Danny went to one of these nights and after several people had spoken, there was a break where nobody had talked and Danny who had been just like sitting and listening and she was in awe of the bravery of these women, she got up, right? And she walked to the podium to tell her story. She said that when she told her whole story, she felt a lot of power and strength that she thought this man had stolen from her come back to her. And it was in this moment that she realized that even though he had taken so much from her, there was so much that he had not taken, that he hadn't touched, and that he had no effect on. Every year, Danny returned from her home in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area rather, to York County Victims Rights Coalition's March and Candlelight Vigil. People gather who have suffered from a crime, and the first time she went, she knew it was exactly what she needed to do. She returns because the vigil to her represents her survival, her strength, and her hope. And this always brings out really big crowds. In 2009, more than 200 people were present for the 23rd annual March and Vigil. There are always many victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, and family members of murder victims, along with victims of crimes themselves. They all go and they get together so that they can be each other's strength. Danny has said that she's moved on in a way. However, one does move on from something like that. She says she doesn't let what happened to her define her, and she knows that what happened is part of her history, but it is not who she is. Now, as for Dan, Dan said that it took him a bit longer to deal with what happened to him, to really sit back, look at the situation, open up about it, talk about it, get therapy. He feels like it took longer than it should have for him to help himself. He didn't want to confront it. He wanted to just try to ignore it, push it to the side and hope that one day it would go away on its own, but that just wasn't working. But it really like, he went through a lot emotionally, even in court. He said that this ruined his life and like shattered his emotions. Cause remember he said he was having trouble, like even caring about people. So he had a lot of work that he had to do. He says that now though, things are better, that he has taken the time to grow and to heal and to change. And you can see that in later interviews, you can see that he seems a lot better. And him and Danny have actually gone on to, you know, restart their friendship. They're super, super close. They're really, you know, they have, you know, a shared bond over something horrible and they've been able to rekindle that friendship. It's not a romance. It's not that kind of happy ending. They're both actually married, but they're able to be friends without re-traumatizing each other. Danny says that her and Dan are connected by their souls and that they will always be an important part of each other's lives. Oh, and speaking of the fact that they're married, one thing that's super duper cute is that Danny's wedding, the police chief, like some of the officers who worked on her case and also Pete, remember Pete the duck hunter? They were all guests at Danny's wedding and she's gone on to have a daughter, which is just, you know, so I'm just happy that she's happy. You know what I mean? I'm just happy that they're both okay and alive and dealing and found love. And it seems so hard. It seems like it would be so easy to just like stop existing after something like that happens. And I'm glad that they didn't is basically what I'm trying to say. Now for a sort of where are they now ish section, there aren't any um, like super recent articles, but I'll tell you like the latest thing that I was able to find. Danny earned her master's degree in social services and went on to be a group counselor for those suffering from addiction and mental illnesses. And she lives in Philadelphia and Dan went on to earn a degree in psychology and worked for a research company living somewhere in Maryland. So that's kind of where they are. I don't know what's going on with them now. I didn't try to look them up like online, like on social media or anything, because I just want to let them like have their peace and do their thing and not like get all up in their business. But isn't that just such a crazy case? When I read about this, I was just like, so affected by what happened to them. And I was not alone in feeling that. 
what happened to them really affected people. Like, for example, one of the officers who worked on their case won an award, I believe the year after. It was the 2000 Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Award. And this was given to him by the Police Heritage Museum, which I had no idea was a thing, but I guess he was chosen by his peers. And when given this award, he actually dedicated it to Dan and Danny. And this was the officer I talked about before who had two teenage daughters who were like Danny's age and was super invested in this case. When he got his award, he dedicated it to Dan and Danny. Man, it's just so wild that this even happened. Like when I think about it, it's just so many things that had to come together. Wrong place, wrong time, you know? Like William didn't even live right there. He lived in York, but he was there visiting his girlfriend's brother and just knew that the boat launch was like a good place to let his dog run and splash. And then as far as Dan goes, he was from Bethlehem, which was like two hours away. And he just happened to be here to see Danny. It's just like so many of these little pieces had to fit together for something so horrible to happen. And then so many other pieces had to fit together for them to survive. Now, I want to end this video with a quote from Dan, because I feel like this perfectly rounds up this, this video. It perfectly rounds up the story. It gives his perspective, both the positive and the negative. Dan said, quote, I'm a little more paranoid around strangers, and I'm a little more wary of going places on my own. But I also believe I was given a gift, a second chance, and that there's a reason why I'm still here. He added, you learn to do a lot with your life because it can be short. You learn to appreciate the people you love because they can be taken away very quickly. And then Dan said that he's glad that it's over, but it'll never be closed. And with that, that my friends is the wild survival story of Danielle Keener and Daniel Zapp. I hope you found this to be interesting and informative and I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Dan and Danny with me today. Now, considering everything I told you through this video, I wanna revisit the question of the day, and that was this. How do you think it's possible that Dan and Danny survived what they went through? Because I still cannot understand how all these pieces, pieces fit together so perfectly that they were able to survive. And also, do you think that this should be the standard of how attempted murder cases are handled? Because I'm so tired of seeing people try to kill people and get light sentences, a slap on the wrist, get out and go on to do these things again, because we, I've heard, I've read so many things about it and it makes me crazy. <laughs> but anyway, let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Please, before you leave, don't forget to leave me a comment down below with any cases you'd like to see me cover. As you may or may not know, I have a long list of cases. And whenever you leave me a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because you often suggest cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my membership. We can get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. And now I just want to say one last thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.